Over to you, Maureen. Thank you very much. Um, we've got um, we've got two really interesting and rather different um, speakers um, today, but I think I think you'll see once they said you know once they've said their bit that they're they're actually very um, very concerned about the same uh, the same topics. We've, first off, we um, we have Dr. Daphne Rickson who um, has done lots of research. Um, herself across um, cooperative performance, um, how cooperatives can um, evaluate, report um, and account for um, their different uh, ways in which they perform. Um, but also as a research coordinator, as the um, director of the Centre of Excellence in Accounting and Reporting for Cooperatives um, at um, St Mary's University in um, Canada, coordinating lots of fascinating um, research on how um, how co-ops can um, report and account um, different ways of thinking about the way that co-ops um, are working how the principles the co-op principles go with the SDGs how we can um, how we can um, approach all of those um, and then we've also got Dr Graham Boyd who's going to talk after um, after Daphne um, really about the sort of six capitals and um, how they can be applied in very sort of different ways to um, to companies. Um, and I, I loved um, what you said, Graham, about what we need to think about when we're thinking about companies is what is it that the company is seeking to enable and what is it seeking to protect? And the way that we can think about the different contributions that people make, uh, that finance makes, that um, the different capitals make um, to the ways in which um, companies um, operate. So um, thank you very much for being here, both of you. Um, and I'll hand over to Daphne to uh, to do a short statement and then we'll, um, um, I, don't know, I don't know if you want to, do the two statements and then have a discussion. That's the best way, isn't it? The two statements and then then you ask the, the question. And then ask the questions yeah. rather than statement and question, statement and yeah. questions. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that's the best way to do it. Okay, over to you, Daphne. Okay, thank you so much, Maureen. So the topic of my uh, talk is uh, the financial wealth uh, of cooperatives versus the cooperative health. And... Um, it's moving along here. It doesn't want to. <laughs> if you maximize the screen, if you go to animations, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so when we're looking at financial health, uh, as an accountant, of course, I, I wouldn't argue about financial viability, but I think when you're reporting on cooperative performance, both looking at your financial and non-financial information, I think it's important to report more than just the financial performance. Um, I would contend that the financial wealth should not obscure the cooperative health. Um, of um, an organization. However, I think there's got to be a balance. So, you know, how much uh, wealth versus cooperative health? And uh, an interesting concept I think would to consider is the concept of enough. And uh, this was an opinion piece by Ian Glassford, who's a retired uh, VP uh, for a, a the credit union in Canada, and he's also on the board of directors for uh, CARC. And uh, when you read Ian's work, which was published in the uh, our journal, the International Journal of Cooperative uh, Accounting and Management, um, he makes the argument that, uh, you know, is the amount that you're spending on your cooperative difference, in other words, what the member sees or gets that they would not get if they did not exist as a cooperative, is that amount growing or shrinking? And do cooperatives even know how much it is? And finally, he makes the argument, do you know how much you can spend without risking the financial viability of your cooperative? So um, I would argue that, you know, the financial uh, performance information does need to be expanded to include uh, 
really what makes the cooperative a different from any other type of business enterprise. Um, so how can we go about then measuring cooperative health in addition to your, obviously your standard financial statements, uh, perhaps the non-financial uh, key performance indicator information should be more seriously considered. So at CR, which is the Center of Excellence in Accounting and Reporting for Cooperatives, we've been working on two uh, projects with uh, groups of cooperatives to develop uh, cooperative performance indicators. And uh, the first project was related to identify metrics uh, to report on the seven principles. So the cooperatives themselves came up with a total of 35 metrics reflecting the seven principles. The second important way I think that cooperative health can be measured would be to look at how they are reporting on the UN uh, SDGs. So we're working on another project with another group of cooperatives uh, and uh, they've identified 25 metrics uh, representing the, uh, the SDGs. And uh, prior to starting the project, uh, our, my project co-lead on this, uh, Fiona Duguid, she uh, did some research on this to see whether or not co-ops were actually, you know, embracing the SDGs and sustainability. So she did a content analysis and she found that in Canada, uh, about 53% of uh, cooperatives made some mention of uh, SDGs, but compared to uh, her sample of 50 uh, co-ops in um, internationally, uh, their level of reporting was much higher, it was around 86%. So in addition to measuring the seven principles and the UN SDGs, I also think it's important for cooperatives to do more than trend analysis. I think benchmarking is extremely important. Obviously trend analysis is too, but I think it's critical to compare to your peers when you're reporting on uh, particularly the non-financial uh, cooperative performance uh, type of information. And uh, uh, Fiona and I did have a, a paper published about how to develop the cooperative benchmarks, and that was in uh, the Journal of Cooperative Studies a while ago. So basically, I guess what I'm contending is that in addition to the financial information, cooperatives really need to demonstrate their cooperative difference in terms of how they're reporting on their performance. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to Graham. Thank you, Daphne. Right, so that's me up now. Um, let me just switch over to screen sharing, jolly good. And that's my screen. So you know, what we're, up to is building connected regenerative business ecosystems and you know, there's there's one big reason why we're doing this which is we're, we're facing global challenges that humanity has never seen before whether you're looking at climate change water scarcity in much of the world food scarcity wherever you look we're facing challenges um, now, I, I believe and what drives me is that business is a superbly powerful tool with huge potential to actually take on the global challenges that we're facing. However, business, as we currently conceive of it and structure it, is just not up to the task. And a metaphor that I love to use, up until Gustav Eiffel started to build his tower in Paris, the highest structure that we'd ever been able to build was the Ulm Minster at 162 meters height. The genius of Gustav Eiffel was to realize that to build something higher than that, and meaningfully higher, not just 165 meters high or perhaps 170, 
but to build the Eiffel Tower, which at 324 meters is exactly double the height of the highest structure that had ever been built before um, in terms of a spire, it had to be built in ways that were fundamentally different. And Gustav Eiffel realized, well, the way to build a really high tower is to build it primarily with empty space, not solid stone. So he came up with wrought iron um, rods connected together with most of it empty space. So we've started asking ourselves oof, 13 years ago now, when I left Procter & Gamble, you know, how do you build an ecosystem of businesses that can be truly regenerative for the entire planet? And we came up with one way of looking at it. We said, okay, there are, we can look at it through six distinct layers and we need to make changes in all of these layers. You know, the way we deal with interactions in business, that's not good enough. The way we interact with ourselves is not up to the task. How many people are suffering huge stress, physical ill health, ill health in our relationships with each other? The way we organize to do work is not fit for purpose. New ways are emerging like sociocracy, holacracy, etc., which are central. Developmental methods are emerging, which are central here. What most people are not looking at is stratum four how we incorporate. That's critical if we're going to build local business ecosystems that are truly regenerative, that can be part of a solution for a viable society and its economy serving humanity and all of nature on the planet, which is what we're after in Stratum 6, something that really works globally. So the conclusion we came to is you know, we need to focus on stratum four and to build a business that can be really part of a regenerative future, we need to think of incorporation as a way of mediating the systems and interactions between capitals and their stakeholders. And so any business or any type of incorporation that can truly do what Gustav Eiffel did, which is build something that is fundamentally better than what we have today, rather than incremental improvements, we need to go down a route that is very, very different. And I now, sorry, let me go to this one. This is more or less that same thing, but differentiated. What I first of all realized, well, the limited company in many senses is akin to slavery. If you treat a company as property that you can buy or sell, it cannot possibly take accountability for any other capital than the financial capital that's gone into it. Employee participation, I look at, yes, it's better, but it has shortcomings. I looked at standard single stakeholder cooperatives and I thought, yeah, those have a huge amount of good stuff but they don't include all capitals and stakeholders. And I discovered then the Somerset Rules multi-stakeholder cooperative perhaps 10, 11 years ago, and was thrilled to find those, but again, found that they were missing something and started developing on my side, something I called the free company. And a free company, the idea there is it has to include all capitals, and it has to be fundamentally not property. It has to be free. That's something that came out to me as being really important here. If you treat a company as a thing, if you treat it as something that you either own or do not own in opposition to each other, it's going to fall short. And then I came across Rory and his fair shares approach and integrated that with my free commons company, forming the fair shares commons. And the real essence of the fair shares commons is that it's 
it's a way of structuring the systems and interactions in stratum four so that every single business can act in full accountability for everything it touches because everything it touches is part of the internal corporate governance power balance okay all I have, to, I have to hurry you up right right thank you <laughs> all capitals have power all capitals interact and that naturally then forms ecosystems of businesses right sorry to go on for too long there we go okay thank you very much um i i was trying to find a way to hop in and say can we um, can we can we speed up there sorry um so very two very very different um different talks i'm I'm, I'm going to I'm going to risk saying this. I'm constantly struck um, as uh, sort of coming into co-ops from sort of more from social enterprise and actually from um, uh, from charities how um, we get a little bit um, caught up. I think in co-ops about the ownership, about the equity that um, that members have um, in the um, in the co-op, um, and how difficult it is to actually show the sort of um, participation equity um, as opposed to the financial ownership um, sort of equity, although the participation is a sort of ownership as well. Um, and I wondered if, um, I, well, actually, if I could go back to you, Daphne, um, about the, these difficulties about showing the contribution that people make through their participation in the co-op. Yes. Um... I've looked at uh, quite a number of credit unions and insurance co-ops, so mostly, uh, you know, financial institutions. And uh, unfortunately, they look remarkably like commercial uh, banks. <laughs> and uh, in fact, some banks reports they're more co op -y than co-ops. It's, uh, you know, I've been able to find and correlate certain, uh, you know, KPIs that do correlate to the seven principles, but unfortunately, the credit unions themselves don't portray them in that way. They don't even mention it. So they're not really, to me, demonstrating their cooperative difference very well. And my concern there is, you know, if you stop talking about it, um after a while people don't even realize they're members of a co-op it's just like any other business i i said to my students we have um we have a co-op um store on campus uh, at the university i teach at and um i said to my students do you realize it's a co-op you can you can become a member of the co-op um and i showed them my little co-op card and they said oh is that like a tesco loyalty card and i thought oh there's you know there's a massive chasm there isn't there To i said no it'll give you voting rights you can vote you can you know be represented but it's really difficult to um to explain it to them um and I, you're very um I, and you're very hot on um not flagging up property graham <laughs> um how do you think we can show that It's a big question. I, and I don't think that there is any simple answer to showing that. It's, it's very deep inside the, the paradigms, the frameworks that people use to make sense of what's happening in their world. The, yes. the, the idea of how we're in relationship to a company, whether you're a member of staff, a customer, a supplier, or whatever, you know, on, on my side, when I'm talking to anybody who's going to be working with us, that's the major conversation. And it takes a fair bit of time to really explore this. And it takes that time because the biggest task is not understanding the words I'm using and what they mean. It's dismantling the one's internal meaning-making framework and building a new one. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, it, that ties in that question that I've just asked. It sort of ties in um, 
uh, with one of the uh, one of the questions that we asked in the um, in the um, call for papers um, is um, you know the recognition and rewards for the different sorts of capital, but um, I think a sort of a, a, a deeper question that we're asking is um, how do you think the concept of capital, like you talk about um, the different capitals that are being contributed, the social, the, um, the, the human, the manufactured, intellectual, um, how are they being changed, the conception of them being changed in new cooperativism? Sorry, Graham. It right. I wasn't sure whether, which one you're <laughs> Sorry. talking to. So my sense is that we have a long way to go. Um, the, the first thing I'll put in is my, my sense is that to build a world that truly works, no capital can ha have primacy over any other capital. We need all of them and they all need to be in a working relationship with each other. It might be that in a certain moment, one capital has some sense of dominance, but in the next moment, it may be a different capital. And the, the last thing we should be doing is building companies in a way that anchors until the company collapses, a fixed power balance, one capital dominating over another. You know, I don't see that as viable. And the other thing that I think is really important in that sense is the recognition that it's not just about the capital, it's about the currencies that you use to move that capital from one place to another. So for instance, you know, if you have a pound in your pocket and I have a pound in my pocket and we exchange pounds, we each end up with a pound in our pocket. If you have a piece of knowledge about how to build an engine and I have a piece of knowledge about how to build four wheels and a chassis and we exchange, we can both build cars. So intellectual capital multiplies when you exchange it, financial capital reduces by the transaction costs. Natural capital decays over time. If you have a bushel of wheat, next year you might only have half a bushel because the rats have eaten it. So it's not just a multi-capital company, we also need a set of currencies unique to each capital, not just variations of money, pound, dollar, euros, but fundamentally different capitals that have the same native behavior as each currency. And then inside the company, which is part of what we're building, you have currencies for the human capitals, like eBay buy a seller reputation. And then you can really do stuff. Thank you very much. Um, there's a, a, a bit of discussion in the chat that I just wanted to, um, to pull up. Pull up. Um, and that's um, from Rory. Is it a question of reframing in terms um, of membership, recognizing the providers of the forms of, um, of wealth, of, of the capitals, and recognizing them for the purpose of membership. Um, and only then we can get into a meaningful conversation about how different contributions can participate and share in the wealth generated by a co-op. I'm also hugely interested in how um, non-members um, benefit from the wealth generated by co-ops, um, by membership organisations, the sort of membership organisations that, that it's like it's your fifth level, Graham, isn't it? Your fifth and sixth levels that the co-op is generating a cooperative um, economy, culture and society um, that makes it better um, for people who even who, those who aren't members um, of the co-op or members of a, um, a, a different co-op. Um, and so um has has Daphne researched um the the different um contributions or different um different uh stakeholders um how we might um account for their different um different contributions um no i haven't done any you know stakeholder analysis uh in particular um 
you know, one thing I have noticed is that, uh, you know, you have certain co-ops and credit unions where people don't even realize they are members, <laughs> you know, and I think in some, you know, respects, they've kind of lost their way as a co-op, but no, I haven't done any particular stakeholder analysis yet. It's on my to-do list though. It goes so well, doesn't it? It does. I, I just, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're moving into um, breakout rooms and because we've got such a small group, I'm not sure how best to organize it, Rory. That's OK. So um, we probably could create three groups and I'll have to shuffle it around so that the facilitators and panelists are in one and then the other two are broken into two. So um, if you bear with me, um, all I want to say is that when you come back from your breakout rooms, um, Maureen will kind of interview the rest of you about what you've been discussing in the breakout rooms. It's we don't want to go straight to questions or comments for the panelists. We want to have a you know 15 sorry 15 20 minute conversation first, and then we'll get back to the panelists for their closing comments. So um, think about what you want to say back in the plenary when you finished your breakout rooms. And um, perhaps I could remind you that we had like three questions in the. Um, in the call um and the the first was um, forgive me i have to I'm just look making sure i get them right um what recognition and rewards are given for contributions of natural human social intellectual manufactured and financial capital in the co-ops that you're familiar with or do you you know what how do you think they ought to be framed um and how is the concept of capital being conceptualized in the um in the spaces for new cooperativism, co I can't say it. So how do you think that the, those concepts are changing and the importance of the prosumer, the pro producer consumer uh, concept to um, wealth creation in new cooperatives? How important do you think that is? Okay, just to say, Graham, uh, Daphne, Maureen, just reject the invitation that you're about to get. Okay, so I'm opening the rooms now and you've got 20 minutes for your conversation yeah so uh we keep the we keep the the recording running in, in this room so we can go deeper into the, con the conversation so um could i can i ask you daphne you talk about the metrics the 25 metrics mm -hmm. how, how have you do you want to give us some examples of, of the metrics yeah. Well, we uh, right. So Sonia's asking. You... There they come. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. We need help. What, uh, my internet was breaking down, and we, the two of us, are not entirely sure what the questions are. What it is we're supposed to be. Right. I, I, think, I mean, I think the main thing is is you can you know react to the presentations. Um, okay. Uh, if you if you focus on what you've heard from Daphne. I mean, we're trying to get about the way that wealth- And Graham, right? And Graham, yeah. And, and okay. how, how can wealth be conceptualized in a way other than financial terms and recognized okay. and you know, discussed and reported and possibly rewarded? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, who else should be with you? It should be- I don't know. Roger, I think Roger, we're... Roger. I tried to put Roger with you, but uh, he's okay. just stuck in our room at the moment. So I hope Roger will come and join you. Okay. 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 Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Thank you. Assign a new host. All right. Uh, I've got, it's made me host of this room. I'll make you host, Sonia. Helpful to use them. There we go. I'm sorry about that. It's it's somebody asked for help, so I had to shoot off the other room, and it stopped the recording. Yes, it it does that. Yeah. Not a problem. <laughs> right. Pain. So yes, I found looking at that as a sociology of ecosystems really helpful because it, it helps us distinguish you know, which, e which layer are we, or which stratum are we currently talking about, which are the, what influences are there from the other strata yeah. on the one we're talking about, and therefore what is the minimum that we need to be doing across a multiplicity of strata to solve the problem in the stratum we're currently focusing on. No, that that makes that makes loads of sense. I I listened to a program this morning on the radio about um, about layers in um, in woodland, um, and how um, 
how you need to make sure that that you've got your you've got an understory under your trees but you've also got um sort of several layers under that you've got sort of like you've got brambles but then you've got grasses and ferns and then under that you've got mosses and lichens and all sorts and you need everything you need all of those layers um for everything to be healthy and um and to work well and if one layer you know like if you've got the wrong sort of trees um then um it's not it's not going to uh, it's not going to work it's going to affect the mosses and lichens it's yes ah so uh, this is this is uh ah, Daphne looking at the question i asked before mm -hmm. i ducked out is that yes right? yes yeah so these uh were all uh these were all selected by the cooperatives uh so um and then we correlated them with various sdgs as well as with the cooperative principles yeah so you know i mean some of them are pretty basic you know uh does your co-op or mutual have shares owned by non-members uh you know mm -hmm. then we capture all the detailed information how many shares yeah uh, the value etc no, so I've always, I don't know whether you're going to get to, I've always wanted to know, you know, what, how many and what percentage of your customers are members, how many and what percentage of, all, of your workers are members, um, so that there's, there's pressure on co-ops to report on, you know, whether they are excluding workers from membership or excluding customers from membership yes. um, by policy. Um, exactly. Yeah. Also, I think I think for the large British retail co-ops to flag up how customers don't particularly want to be members. Yes, I mean, they're uh, missing a really big opportunity because they just don't they don't sell themselves as a co-op to um, to customers. Yes, and also what share of surplus goes to yes yeah you know, the different member groups. I mean, this having to be public about this would. Yeah. Uh, force them to account for i mean it's like the italian co-ops you know i think the membership can be as low as 20 percent amongst the yeah. workers whereas in in spain it's sort of 75 80 percent generally that's and the metric eight daphne that's what's the um non-voluntary layoffs yes yeah really important so it captures two sdgs and two principles mm. and then the next yeah. one like we're looking at you know, uh, diversity. So in terms of age groups, uh, indigenous women, you know, disability, yeah. physical minority, et cetera. On metric eight, that would be great if it had percentage two. Mm. The absolute number tells you yeah. one story, but- Exactly. You know, it, so yeah. what we're doing here is this is just the spreadsheet. So yeah. uh, we're getting people to put in their actual numbers then we do the calculations behind the scene to change it to a percentage. Okay, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So our grand plan here is uh, once we finalized all of this, because we're still looking at definitions and, mm -hmm. you know, we've settled on the 25, but it's a matter of, you know, definitions and calculation methodology, making sure that's all clear. So the idea here is, uh, next step is to develop like a web tool so people can the cops can enter in their data so if you get enough of them doing it enough critical mass then eventually we will have enough data for benchmarking and I think that's where it could get really interesting because there's very few if any publicly available uh, co-op specific benchmark information so I think that would be very helpful in demonstrating the cooperative difference. But that's been my brain. Public. This could take years. <laughs> I have to get money first <laughs> to get the web tool created. <laughs> How public is this? Because it's it. I mean, I'm sure the conversation is going to occur at Co-op Exchange as to what information a co-op that wants to list on Co-op Exchange will have to provide to the users mm -hmm. of that platform. Yeah. So the way this is going to be set up is. Each uh, co-op can see their own data, but they can only see the others in aggregate. So we're trying to protect, uh, you know, confidentiality and and things of that nature. Because people are very get really squirrely. They can put something in an annual report or on a website, but the minute and it's public, but the minute you call it data and you want to put it in another spreadsheet, they get all, you know, they get all uptight about it. So. 
that's what we're proposing is they can only see the others in aggregate. That, that, that seems to me, I mean, how, if, if there's to be a form of peer pressure in the co-op movement to, to follow co-op values and principles, it seems there'd be merit in, in having to publish it. But then I suppose there's different, it's a different discipline for research as it mm -hmm. might be for something like a, a co-op exchange platform where you, you would necessarily be expecting people to make information public. Would you but not? if you've got it as in aggregate and you've got averages, then you can see whether you're above or below average, can't you? So it will force the I below suppose, average. Yes, yes, I suppose there could there would be that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is we're capture, capturing the uh, industrial sector. So then you could compare to co-ops in your yes. own sector. Yes. Or you could compare to all co-ops. It's it would be your choice. You can slice and dice any way you want. But again, that's that's down the road when I get more money. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's pretty brilliant so far. So is this still a work in progress or is that published in the paper with Fiona? Uh, no, this is still a work in progress. We yeah. are, I think we've got four more metrics, the last four to kind of finalize in terms of uh, the actual definitions and calculation methodology, because what we did was we started off with over 400. So we kind of went out and scoured all kinds of metrics that would reflect SDGs. Then our research group, we narrowed it down to 50. And from we sent those 50 then out to the co-ops. And then from there, they selected 25. So now we're going to we're circled back. Then we sent out the 25 to the co-op sector at large to get general feedback on the 25. Does this make sense? you know, mm -hmm. from a definitional point of view, blah. Yeah. So we got their feedback. So now we're just going back and fixing it up, but we're still left with 25. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, so we are going to be publishing a paper on, you know, how yeah. we did this and, you know, yeah. and what they selected. Okay. We started off, the idea was supposed to be participatory action research, which is how we approach the seven principles. Mm -hmm. So we just sat back and they came up with things. But for the SDGs, there's just so many out there. We thought we've got to help them. Like mm -hmm. just to say, what metrics do you want for the 17 SDGs? It was just too much, especially for the small and medium size. So we kind of narrowed it down to 50 for them. <laughs> but then they selected <laughs> yeah. the, the 25. Are there any, are there any, any emergent metrics because I mean, Graham, you've got uh, other, not just your own incubator, but you, like Solve Earth. I don't know what expectations are emerging on, in the ecosystems you're building regarding the reporting of stuff against SDGs. Yes, and indeed, and indeed core principles for that matter. Mm. And at, at the moment, I'm it's saying well connected with the work being done by a few people around R3.0. Um, in particular, Mark McElroy has developed an approach to multi-capital accounting. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm keeping a close look at that. The, the, the two things that for me, I think are really important here. One of them is that you, things need to be joined up. Mm. You know, the, the big power of an accounting approach is to use it to hold yeah. to account. And so for me, the, you know, when financial accounting, <laughs> generally accepted accounting practices came in, that was the big power that you could have a standardized way to compare companies and hold them to account financially. Yeah. And that's what I'm looking for across all of the other capitals. Yes, because it, it's right. I mean, it, I imagine. I mean, Maureen, we was was it the paper we co-authored with David and submitted to Japan, where we map um, we map the principles against SDGs. I, yes. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could map the metrics against not the SDGs. Sorry, we map the co-op principles. Yeah, the SDGs against the co-op principles, and also against the forms of wealth. So I'm wondering if the metrics could be mapped against the forms of wealth, which would give you a structuring to you know, how much how much human, yeah. social, um, intellectual wealth you're creating. 
Um, there's quite a lot here for people to report on, isn't there? Yeah, so this document looks kind of nasty, but when it's done um, in the web, it'll be, all of this will be drop down screens. So yeah. it'll be much easier. Right much now, easier we don't have that ability and we love spreadsheets anyway, so it doesn't bother us. <laughs> We're quirky like that, but uh, this is going to look much better. You know, there'll be, you'll put your cursor on it and, you know, you'll get your definition, your calculation methodology. So, but right now, of course, we don't have a way to really neatly do that. Mm. No, and it could, it would, wouldn't it? Since they map against SDGs and principles, it would map against um, the four, the, the six forms of wealth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that could yeah. be done. Sure. I mean, it's just a, it's just a way of forming a narrative, yeah. Uh, rather than changing anything, I think. Yes. This is really interesting. Um, uh, I've just but I need to. I've just I've sent out an eight minute warning. I'm just about to send out the four minute warning mm -hmm. that uh, the will be reconvening in four minutes. Yeah. So yeah, this will become public once we you know finish our fine tuning, we will be writing, Fiona and I will be writing the paper on it for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. It's worth, worth it's worth, um, it's certainly worth, uh, keep, I can keep publicizing stuff. I'm not planning to write anything more, but in, in the role that I've got now, I can keep different parties connected to uh, interesting projects and, and, and yours is definitely one of them. Uh, Roger, I don't know if you're with us or not. We can see you. We can't hear you. Um, I haven't been able to move you into another group, and I'm not sure what's happened with, him, with Grant, whether he's listening in to us rather than listening into the other groups as well. But if you are listening, Grant, I hope that's been interesting. Um, what, do we, what do we want to chat about? We've got about three minutes before I close the breakout rooms. Um it does some um, it does sort of fit um with this but um we were thinking rory weren't we about how um access to and enjoyment of the various different sorts of capital yeah. is more important than ownership and you're into a really really difficult area to yeah. um actually demonstrate that aren't you if that's what we're thinking is it is i think i think the the argument that i sort of settle on is that ownership matters in as much as, oh, we've lost Daphne. Oh. Ownership matters in as much as it affects access. Um, yes, because you can control it, but yeah. you can also have pretty good access without having ownership, so long as yes. you've got an idea of stewardship or guardianship or a sort of yeah. asset locks. Um, but it's a way of linking the two together that doesn't make it an either or. Um, and David Elliman was always, I think cohort movement generally argues that ownership is necessary to maintain access. That's their, yes. that's their rationale for ownership. I, uh, I remember one of the Co-ops UK lawyers saying to me when, um, uh, is it Fiona Reynolds who used to be the um, CEO of the National Trust? She'd addressed Co-ops Congress and she said yes. the National Trust, because it's a membership organisation, is a co-op in all but name. Um, and the lawyer I was sitting beside, she said, no, it's not because of ownership. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember I thought ever since I mean, it's a w long while ago. And I thought, no, it isn't the ownership that matters. It, it, it is. Um, it's the protecting. And it, it's something that you said, Graham. It's what, what does the company seek to protect? Yes. What really does it protect and enable? Yeah. You know, I, I fully agree that what really matters is is the ability to access and enjoy the yeah, and the benefits it. of a certain capital. Yes. And I'd I'd add to the question, you know, which kinds of capital should never ever be treated as something to own? You know, yes. in most countries today, the idea of owning a human being is contrary to law it's you know slavery is the application of any or all of the properties of property any any or all of the concepts of property to a person and you know things like intellectual capital well should that ever be treated as property you know i guess it's like i i 
find the idea of artistic copyright quite good because um so you know people say all artists steal all the time i mean you do yeah. you you pitch ideas don't you it's um how can you possibly learn and grow without um yeah, without access to other people's intellectual capital. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And in addition, yes, so much in the creative field emerges out of the zeitgeist. Absolutely. So, you know, there's a brilliant radio podcast by Sideways is the name. And he was about to publish a book. And the first two chapters of the book appeared as an article in a, by another journalist. And neither had copied from the other. It was completely independent, created, but almost identical. Yes. Hi, yes, Darren. it is. It's the zeitgeist. Oh, no. Here it comes, everyone. Okay, so Maureen, I'll, I'll tell you who was notionally in each room. Um, ah, Daphne's back with us. That's good. Okay, so um the room two was darren Gillian, and martin and room, room three was mostly timothy and sonia but roger eventually uh, joined them i think right <laughs> okay. yeah so uh, well perhaps i could ask group one to just give us your thoughts um the, the discussion and um, that you had before we sort of carry on with um a discussion with everybody would somebody from that group well i'm gonna start uh because i'm not shy and uh, <laughs> 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 timothy and i had a nice uh, well i had a lecture from him about african uh, credit co-ops and uh, you know savings and credit cooperatives so that's pretty much what we talked about um and you know and how, uh, well, some of them uh, take deposits and look a lot like banks and others are just savings uh, co-ops and so on. But in that conversation, um, you know, as to what they do and how they look a lot like banks and so on, then we shifted into, okay, do they do anything differently? And how would we measure that? And it sounds like uh, really the SDG framework uh, works well in this context, because once you start talking, okay, do they do anything different on, on employment and how they pay and how nobody lost a job during COVID crisis and how, you know, all of that stuff actually bubbles up. So SDG as a framework seems to work. Uh, and then if you look at the gender component, if you look at education, so Timothy, if you want to add anything else here, by all means, but you know, it sounds like SDGs uh, is a good framework to actually give that alternative uh, to, oh, are they financially healthy or not? Yeah, it, Timothy, it, agree? It, yeah, thank you so much. I do, I do agree with you because um, when you know you are just looking at this, especially financial cooperatives, the way they are arranged, you may think they are more of conventional businesses. And, uh, but when you internally look at how they contribute to specific items uh, that actually uh, enhances community wealth. For example, look at decent work and then come to during COVID-19. I was happy to, to participate in, in a research which was actually supported by OCDZ uh, earlier this year, around March. And we were looking at uh, what is, for example, what is how have how have cooperatives uh, managed to contribute or rather to respond to COVID nineteen shocks? And we were surprised that even in the corporate cooperatives in the aviation sector, horticulture se sector, none of them have sent home employees during this COVID nineteen period. Even despite them having no businesses running because it was affected by COVID nineteen, so. So when you look at the SDG framework, the way it is, then look at uh, community health or community well as it is uh, in its own definition. Perhaps I think that the best approach we could measure the contribution of the cooperative movement, we can link this to SDGs. Look at, create uh, a few indicators. How are cooperative uh, contributing to zero poverty, for example, or no poverty? How are they contributing to zero hunger? How are they responding to the environment? How are they responding to education? Uh, you know, 
look at how are they responding to even partnership for the goals. Uh, I'm happy uh, in our coastal region part of Kenya, we have that is a financial based cooperative have come up into associations. Like we have the Kenya Association of Teacher Based Circles. Uh, and then when you look at this particular association, what they are doing, that particular partnership, they have scholarships, you know, for young people. They are coming up with, you know, agribusiness initiatives to support, you know, young people who are interested in agribusiness. Some of them actually, like the Coastal Association of Teacher Based Circles here in Kenya, have come up with, a, you know, an initiative to support young girls in high school, where they are supporting them with sanitary towels or rather, uh, you know, uh, hygiene uh, for hygiene purposes while they are in school. So. Personally, I think the best way we could measure the cooperative uh, wealth, or rather how corporate are contributing to community wealth, is perhaps in terms of SDGs. And even I was telling uh, Zanja, the Sanjo here that um, even in Africa, we're talking about Africa Agenda 2063. And this Agenda 2063 have set out some aspirations. And when you look at th those aspirations, then look at what the cooperative movement is doing you can see their contribution and you cannot rule it out. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I love that idea of thinking about the cooperative difference in terms of community wealth and health. It's, um, it's really nice. Um, thank you. And, and group two, or was that group two? The other group, um, other group. Can somebody tell us what you were talking about, please? It's Darren, Gillian and Martin. Okay, I'll, I'll kick start. I think Martin's, Thank you probably very much. Be better, Martin's going to be a better summariser than me, I've got a feeling. Um, but, um, or Gillian for that matter. Um, the, I'm just going to pick on one point which we we finished the conversation with, which, which seems to be a nice place to start here. Uh, and that's the point about the human capital. And, um, and I loved uh, uh, Graham's um, description or metaphor of having two people, bits of knowledge of how to build a car, and they grab it from whether you're the person that designs the engine to the, the the chassis or whatever it is coming together and then you can actually uh, uh, get much more from those two pieces of, of knowledge and the thing that as we were talking in the, our group the thing that struck me was the the priority over the the capital might be uh, important in terms of development and the future new cooperativism is that if the um if the um the potential participants in any new body organization, whether it's a cooperative uh, or otherwise, is that if the, um, the human capital establishes how it's gonna work or what it wants in terms of those, uh, of those values and principles and everything moving forward, and then combines it with some objective whether, uh, or business, then you can start to um, um, prioritize the other capital elements and and as you know, whether that's picking the fair shares model or whether that's uh, operating a platform in a particular way that I guess the point I'm trying to make is get the human capital right and then the other stuff will follow. It's kind of a sequence. Um, but uh, Martin or Gillian, I think there's probably, we, we had a great discussion at some of the other points. We had an interesting discussion, but we didn't. Yeah, we hadn't made a proper note of the three questions that we were supposed to be addressing and we couldn't actually find them in the documentation. <laughs> so um, we didn't really focus on that. Uh, one issue that did come up towards the end was, which is maybe worth focusing on a bit more, is the issue of scale and the point at which uh, membership uh, participation and involvement and a sense of ownership, not necessarily owning property, but just owning the process becomes more and more difficult. Uh, and so you have the example, for instance, of the Mondragon cooperatives in the Basque country where they have uh, consciously set out to limit the size of individual enterprises and units within the uh, overall Mondragon corporation. And in, I was also mentioning that in the latest issue of Cooperative News, there's some very interesting articles about how energy cooperatives are rethinking what their purpose is so they might start off as putting solar panels on community roofs but then they have to address issues about um, batteries for storage of uh, energy and so on and also the whole question of 
sharing intellectual capitals with other renewable energy cooperatives and not just in uh, one community or one country, but uh, for instance, there's a very interesting article about doing it across Europe. So, but I think that's about as far as we got in terms of our discussion. Uh, Gillian might want to add a, a little bit because we also did delve back into the early nine, the late 19th century <laughs> in part about mem members joining as economic in, uh, members for a dividend, but not really taking on board any wider co cooperative conceptions. Um, yeah, in, in the 19th century, they actually coined a, a term of economic members, those who joined for the dividend but didn't actually know what they were becoming part of, which really chimed with me with the, the talks today, because the same thing is going round and round. And, um, the more I look at the history of the cooperative movement, the more I see things as going round in circles, and the same thing crops up. And for me, one of the interesting things is the, um, the sheer breadth of new cooperatives that are being set up, all doing different things. And it strikes me that it, it's probably very similar to the 19th century where groups of people were setting up cooperatives and there wasn't really a set model. You know, they, they might pick up ideas from other people, but there wasn't a set model that they were following. So each group of people was setting up their own rules, their own ways of dealing thing, with things um, for their own set of members. And it became quite individualistic until they said, hang on, we need to get some ideas together and started things like the Cooperative Union to exchange good ideas, good practice, and just solve problems that somebody else would have solved but you know it's that uh sending out information to make sure that everybody benefits from it and i think that's one of the things that we were talking about in the breakout room is that people do offer their expertise and their knowledge quite freely um, and it, it's interesting to see what benefits they get from giving out their own expertise. So it's quite an interesting time, I think, for, for new cooperatives being set up. I think, um, and Ro Roger did research on this, um, must be nearly 10 years ago when they were looking at a curriculum for social economy managers. Um, and I've seen this repeatedly across um, different PhD studies that I've supervised or examined, is, is the, it's one of the ways that you can express the difference between the social and the cooperative economies and the private sector is in this willingness to share intellectual property, human, uh, human wealth, social wealth, the, the, you know, the willingness to share contacts, the willingness to put people in touch with other people who can help. Um, and, you know, I mean, the way that you really experience the barrier is when you get into a conversation with something and they say, oh, I need you to sign this non-disclosure agreement before I tell you any more. That's, you know, that's the sort of standard practice in the private sector. I never experienced that in the cooperative economy, although there's one or two people I think that we need to wean off that mindset um, I can think of. But they're kind of new players in that space, so they haven't yet extricated themselves from the private sector mentality. Um, at the same time, you know, I mean, uh, there's this question of how you protect that bit of expertise that your livelihood depends on. Um, which I think, uh, you know, the question is whether you can find more security in, in collective property than you can in personal property. And that's personal property, both at the level of the firm and of, of the individual, which is Ostrom's point, isn't it, Graham? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's quite a vexed question, I remember, for some of your clients, like Solve Earth, you know, where the boundary points are, about the boundary of membership, which is also an expression of what you value as wealth, what you value as human and social wealth. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for, for me, one of the pivotal moments in my journey was going back into the etymology of the word company which comes from the Latin companis with bread. Mm. And the or original root meaning of company is a group of people who share resources with each other because each individually can thrive better through sharing. Yeah. So for me, that's what a company is really about. 
The etymology of cooperate, Gillian. <laughs> be an interesting contrast. There's a paper in that. <laughs> there would be. I have no idea, to be honest. It has to do something with working together, presumably. I would have thought it, it literally means, you know, operating, uh, operating together, yes, operating yeah. together. Uh, and then when you put Commonwealth on the end, then I think you, you get the added layer, don't you? Yeah. And Rory and I have had um, some discussions um, actually about using, using the word capital at all. I find yes. coming from a finance background, I hate it. I absolutely hate talking about social capital. Um, and I, I think what, what you said, Timothy, about the SDGs providing a really good framework, you don't need capitals to um, to talk about. The, and actually, we, we got around it by calling you know, forms of wealth. Forms of wealth but, yeah. um, um, but, you know, if you put the SDG framework, it sort of supersedes, really, doesn't it? Thinking about different sorts of capital almost. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Maureen. I'll jump in on that one. Thanks for bringing it up, because that was my next point in the conversation, uh, that we are we seem to not be able to stay away from the language. Uh, and so in, in some of the work we're doing on, on indicators uh, with UNRIS, uh, they, we landed on resources rather than capital. Mm. So yes. it's also yeah. in the, you know, and, and uh, Graham, you just said, group of people coming with their resources right yes and so this is really what kind of resource do you have and it can be all kinds of knowledge uh or or financial resources but yeah so they, they, we had the same struggles with the capitals i I've, um, I've had the same struggle with resources though i mean i i uh, i can think of two two employee-owned businesses they rejected they didn't want a human resource manager because it, it sounded oh, yeah. Too oh yeah yeah no human oh, resource so, yeah i and, and, i can appreciate that yeah and bob canell yeah it's just the fact to, that yeah. we value all these capitals or resources or whatever it it, it seems that this is the the ecologist's uh, complaint right that it, it seems that we only assign value in production when when the environment has to have value no matter what it's yes. universal it supersedes any kind of activity right and it's really so so by by capitalizing it and calling it that and and internalizing it to uh, economic functioning we're really giving it value only in those contexts and humans have value outside of it and so on so so this is the the struggle right that you have to be sustainable for the sake of sustainability and the planet and it has nothing to do with your economic functioning or it shouldn't have it's the right thing to do right <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing so co-ops are good at at saying where it's the right thing to do but yeah. on the other hand we are we're pulling it even even in the research context we're pulling it back under that umbrella of value assigned only through economic function yeah. um, and another thing that i think we are not talking about enough is about this collective nature we just now started right so this collectivity as an enterprise, call it co-op, call it whatever, and also the role in decommodifying the enterprise. So I think that's when we get into uh, the commons, right? Even the language fair share, I have a problem with because it's distributing, distributing fairly, but it's still, the activity is still under the umbrella of economics. So, uh, yeah, and ownership really. So it's just, you know, how many different stakeholders are owning the business and therefore have these rights, whereas we need to really decommodify and have this enterprise as not for sale and, and for wealth you know, building uh, for all involved. I don't know how, how to uh, well, frame what, it now. That's what I think Graham, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I think Graham's taken the, the debate around fair shares the furthest in that direction in talking about a fair shares commons and preventing you know basically the free company is something that is can't be resold on a market and therefore the people within it can't be resold on a market um you know through you know product transfers and, and the like yeah so, so one yeah. measure is indivisible reserves i would i would you know we're not yeah. talking about that enough either so in the co-op world it's indivisible reserves and what what happens to the company when people who are now running it are no longer interested or are going bankrupt or want to sell that you can't sell it and it has to belong to community or however defined. So this indivisible reserve aspect of cooperation is really important. And in countries where it exists, the co-op movements are the strongest. Yeah. Um, so, so that's something that we need to talk about as well.
I'm keen. Uh, can I ask um, Timothy a question? Yes, you um, can. You said you're you can based ask... in Kenya. Sorry? Did you say you were based in Kenya? Yes, I'm based in Kenya. I'm in Nairobi yes. right now. So maybe you can help me with an apparent anomaly, which is um, there's been a PhD by somebody from the ILO saying that in 90% of Africa's economy is informal. So it's not it's not through formally constituted organizations, most ac economic activity. And yet um, Kenya claims, I think Nathan Schneider claimed about half of the GDP in Kenya is through co-ops. I'm just wondering, are many of these co-ops informally organized or are they registered co-ops? Um, I, I, I think that could be a wrong assertion to me <laughs> that 50% uh, that, uh, of of Kenyan corporate who contribute the GDP, but uh, I could say the financial cooperatives because when mm -hmm. you look at the, the contribution of the financial cooperatives is overwhelming, mm -hmm. offer forty one percent. I think last time I checked it was close to forty one percent. So and that was in twenty sixteen. So this is twenty twenty one. It mm -hmm. could be fifty percent. Um, but um, in terms of informality of the cooperative uh, movement in Kenya, again, I will agree that um, except the financial sector cooperatives, mm -hmm. but all other sector cooperatives happen to be informal. The way they run their things mm -hmm. is just casual. Yeah, they, they have registered, they are registered, they have their documents. But uh, surprisingly, you may find a cooperative which was started in 1970, and the founding chair chairperson is still the chairperson today, uh, of uh, 50 years, or right. rather 40 years. So mm. I, I, I could say informality in some sectors, especially agricultural cooperatives, it is there. And um, no, I have a story. Someone was telling me a story that the Pro Flori, you are here in Kenya and uh, you feed, you you assisted a certain cooperative to raise some chicken and uh, <laughs> the yes. chicken got lost <laughs> because yes. the leadership was there and this leadership is the same leadership today. So uh, there's a lot of informality, but um, perhaps I could say, yeah, in terms of transparency, in terms of accountability, and in terms of uh, uh, formality, adhering to structures, governance structures uh, that have been laid out, I would say that financial cooperatives are doing amazing. And uh, their contribution to the national GDP is very amazing. Remember, the World Cooperative Monitor, um, if you look at the report for 2020, you could see the Cooperative Bank of Kenya, which is actually a bank for the movement here in Kenya. Oh, okay. uh, not just even for the Kenyan movement, but the, for the East African movement, understanding that uh, it draws much more of their customers. And actually, most of their customers are the financial cooperatives, the saving and credit cooperative drawn from Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, so Kenya, it's a tertiary, and South Sudan. A tertiary yeah. co-op, in effect. Yes. OK. I think uh, my, my, what was going through my head there was the amount of human and social capital that might be in the informal cooperative movement as, as opposed to any other form of, sorry, I'm using the word capital again, um, resources, wealth, whatever we call it, the, uh, the, 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 well, the, the wealth of a different okay. nature. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been <laughs> trying to try myself. Say, <laughs> what I could mention is, um, yeah, we could have uh, maybe some sort of, well, yes, that's very true. But uh, I happen personally to find some of the cooperatives, especially here in Kenya, if I look at the agricultural cooperatives, I have never seen them as sustainable enterprises. Because um, if you find an enterprise which is operating seasonally, if you're only depending, for example, on coffee, when you have Paris, that is where you have uh, resources coming in. That's where you have an activity running. If there is no Paris, you are harvesting, you are dormant and you wait for aid for you to, you know, for you to be sustainable. So, uh, but then we have some other social enterprises. Remember, these social enterprises are owned by a group of members, a collection of many other members, but they are not known, they are not called cooperatives. Some of them are called self-help groups. But when you look at the way they are operating, 
uh, if they are in a tea uh, sector, for instance, they have they have they are rearing chicken or they are they are uh, they are rearing pigs, they are rearing rabbits, and they are sustainable. They are running activities from January to December, and they are able to run the activities well. So perhaps. Uh, um, I, I'm always a young person who, once I'm speaking to my cooperative leaders in Africa, I challenge them to start looking at how do we make the cooperative movement sustainable, especially for the young people. Because if we are to look at how do we have failures, diversify the movement, reinvent the will, perhaps transform the movement. So you, uh, then we make it this movement, uh, you know, uh, I've always used that, uh, how do we make the Kenyan cooperative movement or the African cooperative movement sexy for the young people? Okay. Because young people are interested with sex things. So uh, the right. best way to do is to look at what are the activities that are young people interested in? So like uh, today as a young person under the age of 30, uh, assuming I have a kid and I'm, I'm a member of a cooperative which will operate for three months and once our Paris, uh, we are not harvesting Paris, again, we call, uh, you know, we wait for another six months and then we are harvesting for me to have resources. Okay, are we going to have that to? Perhaps, have perhaps to, doesn't make sense. We, 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 we're running yeah. out of time, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, um, thank you. So Maureen, uh, I hand, hand back to you. I think we need to get the closing thoughts of our our two panelists now to uh, this discussion that we've been having. Uh, so so it's been such a wide ranging discussion. I'm not yes. quite sure that I can actually formulate um, a question um, to put to you. Um, I suppose actually I've, I, I would say, Graham, if you could sort of pick up on what Sonia was saying about, um, about not talking about things um, through the sort of through the idea of um, capitals, um, so how you are in um, Evolute Six, sort of looking at um, at addressing addressing those questions, not using though that framework. But you're not you're not specifically using the SDGs either, are you? So I'll pick up on that gladly. the The centre of what the way we're looking at it is that every single word we've ever come across is carrying negative meanings yes. or unhelpful meanings because it's all in some sense associated with the extractive paradigm we're living in. And so our approach is very much one of, well, we have two choices. Either we invent completely new words or we reclaim or redefine existing words. And we've chosen to go down the route of redefining existing words. So, you know, in, in the book I wrote with Jack, we tend to refer to big C capitalism and small C capitalism, big C capital and small C capital. And the big C is where we're, that's our attempt to reclaim the word capital and capitalism to mean what we want it to mean rather than what it currently means. A bit like Alice in Wonderland. No, I mean, no. A word means what I want it to mean. I think you have to get everybody else to believe in it as well, though, don't you? That's that's um, that's the trick. Um, and Daphne, I was wondering if you could, in in our discussion, um, when the breakout rooms were on, um, you were talking about the metrics where you map the principles against the SDGs, and we were talking about maybe it'd be possible to sort of put them against the um, the six forms of wealth. But the SDGs do seem to provide a really good framework for um, actually avoiding discussion of capital, um, which um, I, I don't know what you think. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously all businesses would want to hopefully uh, reflect some of the SDGs in their uh, operations, but I think the onus is on cooperatives more than ever to demonstrate adherence to you know, those SDGs that apply to them, along with the seven principles. I think both sets of metrics are critical in terms of uh, demonstrating the cooperative difference, because if we don't start demonstrating it, we don't start talking about it, then pretty soon people are not going to even understand that they're in a cooperative, you know. 
um, I think this is an ideal opportunity for cooperatives to step forward and really take a leadership role in uh, the SDGs. Do you think that if co-ops benchmark against SDGs, they will be able to show how much better they are at it than um, than commercial corporate with the yeah. sort of well, I think, Yeah, we like to think that they're better, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're not. If we don't measure it, if we don't benchmark it, we'll never know. Yes. That, that's kind of my point about the measuring it and then subsequently benchmarking. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to sort of I think make, make closing remarks or ask a few um, sort of closing questions? No? Yo, oh, Rory. <laughs> I'm trying to find where we where we map. SDGs against both the six forms of wealth and the cooperative values and principles, because that could be helpful. Um, maybe it's in our um, to I profit or not to profit paper, but, um, which we haven't I'm... published yet. No, I'd have to go back and um, and look. David did the SDGs and the yeah. I mean, there, there was a, yeah, we, we took was, that. Yeah, yeah. There was so different papers where David Wren mapped the fair shares values and principles against SDGs. Mm -hmm. But then I remember when I came over, Sonia, to Canada, we I was looking at the forms of wealth against cooperative values and principles. And then in a, in a further piece of work, we mapped the three against each other, the forms of wealth, the SDGs and the co-op values and principles, because I remember that's where we noted how many of the cooperative values and principles seem to deal with social wealth. Uh, although they do spread across the different forms of wealth, there's a cluster um, around the social sphere, social and human. Um, I think, dig that think out. They, might, they might also be a little bit light on natural. Uh, I think the yes. seven co-op principles maybe need to be a bit, um, it's what, it's, it's what um, Tom Webb says, then yeah. we maybe need a few more um, to bring in nature. Yeah, well, it's been nearly, it's getting on for 30 years since they've been agreed. So I'm guessing yeah. there's a debate going on yeah. right now about what the next iteration is going to be. I think uh, it started about a year ago. Is that right, Tonya? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Correct. And there is uh, the Congress coming up, as you know, in uh, December, and that will be the main topic. And then four months after until or even even longer until May. So there is about five months taken to actually distill the input into the Congress and come up with the next iteration or leave it as is. But that conversation is happening, as you say, right now, and it will go to Congress and then and then. Uh, afterwards there is a task force to look at it okay. i think it's something else that co-ops don't advertise anything like enough the collaborative nature of the way that they are defined um when i explain it to mm -hmm. my students in a business school they cannot believe that people are spending their time thinking about what ought we to do you know what what how ought we behave how you know how should we build our economies um it's sort of slightly mind boggling for them. I really don't think that um, we make enough of it. I did, I did have one other closing remark, which um, we discussed a little bit in the pre-meeting when we had a, um, a pre-meeting for today. Um, and it's something I think about more because of papers recently published, which is the more you restructure your thinking around different forms of wealth, and who provides the different forms of wealth or the you know, resources, if you could, okay. It opens up a whole new question about the nature of open membership. So it, it pushes you towards multi-stakeholder co-op design when you think about enfranchising the providers of different forms of wealth to a co-op. Um, and I think that's a really, I've not made the connection between the the conversation around multiple capitals, multiple forms of wealth, and multi-stakeholder design, until it we, we connected it in in a paper on new cooperativism. So it's the it's the most recent paper in the Journal of Co-op Studies on new cooperativism, and I think really I've got to thank Graham and Maureen because I went back over both of their contributions to that conversation in in uh, arriving at that understanding. 
Okay. And uh, that's, it's kind of on topic for this seminar as well. There's a question. Um, Timothy, you've asked, where do I get the book? Do you mean um, Graham's um, book? Graham's book. Yeah, there's a book that Prof was referring to. Mm. And I was interested in getting to read it. <laughs> right, I'm sure Graham will give you a link. Yes, oh, okay. I'll pop the link up now. Um, and the book is available both to buy from any online retailer and on that website it's available to download for free as a PDF. Jack and I are committed that nobody should have any barrier to reading the book based on the currency that they're earning money in <laughs> or not earning money in as the case may be. <laughs> And you support it with the month. Thank you so seminar. much. Uh, I've received the link and I've already clicked on it on the link and I can see the book. <laughs> okay. Excellent. And you do, you down, do you'll month. see the link to download it. And just next to that, as Rory's pointing out, you can sign up for our mailing list to join our webinars and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess it, it, it remains for me to thank everyone. We're, we're sort of two minutes to five. Um, this is the penultimate seminar. Uh, there's one more on the 8th of November. Um, and I think I've already sent out joining instructions to everybody who signed up to this one. Um, we've got Anna Aguirre from Mondragon, who teaches with Trebor Schultz on the platform co-ops. Trebor himself was originally down to uh, speak, but he's got a teaching commitment that now interrupts his participation. So we're we're looking to approach somebody from the Turkish co-op movement to talk about uh, their platform co-op experiences. And then the second half, so it's a, a three hour job with two one and a half hour slots will be on cooperative publishing. And we've got some really interesting speakers on that one. Um, one from Argentina who is in a cooperative publisher that was a reclaimed company. So um, uh, Argentino Tem Temporo, I think is uh, the name of the, the reclaimed company, along with uh, a North American um, that Nathan Schneider has introduced us to who started coopnews.wiki, which is a, a cooperative publisher. So I think we've had some fascinating conversations around digital platform and publishing cooperatives in, in the final seminar. So I really hope you can join us for that and spread the word. Right, so thank you very much for today. I shall stop the recording. <laughs>